for joining us today. In just a moment, we're going to hear a great talk. But first, take a minute and let us know where you're watching from. As you watch today, we want you to know we've been praying for you and we believe God is going to speak to you through today's teaching. Just a reminder, if you're ever in the Marysville area, we would love for you to join in person for church. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's teaching. Thank you for making Rock Creek a part of your spiritual growth. Hey, Rock Creek Church, Pastor Brian here. We're so glad you joined us wherever you're watching from. I'd like to just take a minute and welcome all of our locations, Marysville and Arlington. We're so glad to have you together as we continue to see our church unfold in uh, two different locations, but one unified church. Uh, God has been doing some awesome things. And so if you're on our YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe for all the latest content. If you're on social media, let us know where you're watching from, who's watching with you, and maybe a highlight from your week. And again, if you've downloaded our app or on our website, make sure you to take some good notes. We like to give you opportunities to fill in the blanks so that this week, maybe if you forget what we discussed in this moment together, you could go back, revisit it, and help you walk out your faith uh, every day. Listen, church is not an event. Uh, faith is not an event. It's a process. And so we want you to continue to wrestle with the teaching today after today is over. So we're in this series called Adulting. Uh, I thought it was a more softer way to say making the hard choices that no one wants to make, but you have to make because you're trying to follow Jesus and grow up in your faith. I mean, right? That, that, that title just doesn't land as, as gently as, as hashtag adulting. That sounds nice. But really what we're talking about is making those hard choices. Making the hard choices that help you actually grow up in your faith. And so as we approach Easter, we're going to continue to be in this collection of talks together, wrestling with God's word, seeing what it has to say about the areas of our life as followers of Jesus that need to kind of uh, grow up a little bit. And, and so it's been a really fun series. Hopefully you've gotten a chance to uh, go back and watch. If you haven't, again, check them out on our YouTube channel. It'll help you kind of catch up. Uh, Easter's coming up, by the way, and so we're going to have Easter weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We're going to have an amazing time together. Uh, six services to choose from, Friday at 7, Saturday 5.30 and 7, and Sunday morning 8, 9.30 and 11. So March 29th through the 30, 31st. It's a little early this, this year, so plan accordingly. Make those spring break plans after Easter. Head out on Monday. Join us all weekend long. It's going to be a blast. But enough about that, let's get right into today's conversation. We're gonna go right to the scripture. Proverbs says this, wise choices will watch over you, understanding will keep you safe. This is a really great foundational uh, uh, thought based off of the book of wisdom about how we are to make the tough choices of life. Wise choices, when you make them, watch over you. Wise choices. See, the difference between where you are and where God wants you to be is your choices. And if you'll choose the right choices, not only will those choices have an effect on you, but they'll have an effect on anyone connected to you, your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, your work, coworkers, a stranger on the street. Choices that you make about you never only affect just you. I mean, that's gold, write it down. Choices you make about you don't always just affect only you. But if you'll make wise choices, they'll only watch over your life. The other night I woke up and, you know, every once in a while you'll have a dream and you're, you know, it's very vivid and real. And, and so we have three uh, great kids, uh, eight, nine, and 10 year old, second, third, and fourth. And our youngest has always been a bit of a sleepwalker. I mean, he'll just get up in the middle of the night, kind of roaming around. I mean, we turn the alarm at night for that very reason. And, and we also lock our door for that very reason, you know what I'm saying, parents? And, uh, but the other night I was having this weird dream and you know when your body tries to wake itself up because it's having like a, you know what someone might call a nightmare or, or a disturbing you know, dream about something that's like intense. And so I had this, we had been watching this show, I kid you not, watching this show, my kids love it, it's called Sewer Divers. And it's like my worst nightmare to get trapped in a sewer trying to clean it out. But my kids think, especially my boys, think it's the funniest show. These guys diving into sewers, cleaning them out. I mean, it, it's wild. And so I'm having this weird, vivid dream about being trapped in this sewer and it was the smell. And the funny thing is I like woke up and there is my youngest son watching over me. 
And it's, I'll be honest, I might have screamed a bit. It, it, it scared me. It startled me. I, and he almost got punched in the face because I thought, who is hovering over me? And then I realized it wasn't the sewer that I was in in my dream. It was his breath. <laughs> it was his breath that was, that was penetrating my soul. And, and <laughs> he was watching over me, okay, which is the opposite of, of wise choices. <laughs> but, but hopefully the image sticks with you. Like, if you'll just choose God's best for you, <laughs> uh, they'll watch over you, <laughs> the choices, and, and keep your life safe. Keep you on a path that's not always perfect, but man, you'll make some progress. Unlike my son who was watching over me, giving me nightmares because of his um, sewer diver breath. <laughs> um, I don't want that kind of watching over me. I, I don't want to go into the, the dark, deep places of life and be lost. I, I want wise, biblical truths to watch over my life. And if you'll just embrace these hard choices, I'm telling you, God will do something incredible, not only in your life, but through your life today. Whether you're a first time watcher for Rock Creek, or maybe you're trying to explore your faith again, it's been a little bit uh, shaky, or maybe you're a veteran Christian today, and you're like, man, I, I, just, I just need a word from God. Well, this is your day. No matter where you are in the gamut of faith, I'm trusting today that the Spirit of God, the same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, will speak to you in these moments together. So let's go to our theme scripture for today. And it says this, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. This is such a big dynamic scripture in Romans. Therefore, that means, listen up. Like this is important. We have been made right in God's sight by faith, by faith. We have peace with God because of what Jesus did for us. Okay, it goes on to say, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into the place of undeserved privilege. So really that's what faith is about. Faith is in who Jesus is in order to have a relationship with God. And because of that relationship with, relationship with Jesus, we have this, this undeserved, unmerited, we call it grace. That grace gets you places that you can't get on your own. And so because of this undeserved privilege, we now stand. We don't, we, don't, we don't sit in a place of shame. We stand confidently. We stand joyfully. And there's some perspective or some future stuff to look forward to. What is that? Sharing God's glory. It's amazing to me. So we're undeserving. We couldn't earn it or work hard enough to get it. But if we'll just have it, that's faith but have it in the right, or have it actually positioned in the right person, which is Jesus, we can have relationship with God forever, and that produces a, a joyful, confident future. Sounds pretty good. This whole faith thing sounds pretty amazing. That if we'll have faith in Jesus, we can have relationship with God, the God who is the creator of all, including us, forever. And even when they're not there yet, we can have joy, we can be confident that there's a future looking, that's worth looking forward to. I don't know, faith seems a bit, a bit amazing, it seems a bit dynamic. It seems like that's what we should be shooting for is, is to have faith. Second Corinthians says it this way, for we live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith. We live by faith, not by sight. So the, the, the crux, the, the pinnacle of Christianity is not what we can touch, taste, or feel. It's what we see by faith. The, the, the important part of our following is faith. But I'll be honest, there's a lot of people who are anti-faith. You probably heard it said that way. They're just anti-faith. They're, they're anti, you know, anything that has to do with trusting in a God who created all things and it seems a little bit far-fetched and I'm not so sure. Have you read the Bible? There seems to be some contradictions and can it really be trusted? And, and really there's some people who push back on this faith and maybe that's you watching today. And, and I just want to address a couple thoughts because I think some of these are valid pushbacks 
to this idea of faith. And the first one is this whole idea of intellectual objections. Hey, you know what? I, I just, it seems a little, I mean, it's nice, the Bible's interesting, but can it really be trusted? Can, how do we know it's accurate? How do we know it's actually God's word and not just Shakespeare? And there's some, some intellectual objections. And, and in a day and age where everything can be Googled and we think because we Googled it, it's true. If we got on WebMD, it's definitely our diagnosis. Come on. Like we gotta be careful not to check our brain at the door, but also not let our brain reason us out of faith. Because what I want to propose to you is that although there are some good pushbacks to faith, faith is still the most reasonable, logical response if there is a God and we have been created by him. So this intellectual objections, if you search the scriptures, if you dive into God's word, if you read some great history about how we got this book, I think you'll discover actually maybe this isn't as strong of a pushback as you think it is. This is a big one. We call it negative religious experiences. Come on, how many, we, in the world of my world, the pastoral world, we call it church hurt, right? And some of you watching today, the reason why you're watching online instead of in a church, in, a per, in person, like in a room with you, is because you've been hurt. And you would call it church hurt. I got some, some, some church hurt. I've been involved in a church, or maybe you were a part of, just not even a church, maybe you're part of a re weird religious experience, a cult or some like weird, you know, sect of religious experience. And you're like, I don't want any of that. I'm not into institutions. I'm not into organizations like Jesus is great, but I don't need the organization. And so you have these religious experiences that were negative. And so in light of that, you push back on the whole faith thing. God is cool. Jesus seems like a, a, a nice historical figure, but I'm just, uh, I, I have had some negative experience, so I'm gonna push back on the faith. I think another one is this, this existential doubts. This, this, these big questions like the problem with evil, suffering in the world, starving children, where is God? This, this existential doubts like how can a good God allow these wh hor horrible things to happen in the world? And again, those are good wrestling questions and those can be addressed, but, but just for a minute go, hey, let's just see the God of the universe, the God of the Bible for who he truly is and not allow a broken world, a sin-filled world to, to cause our faith to be inconsequential. I think another big one is what I call societal influences. Society says, hey, dude, no, no, I mean, back in the 50s and 60s, everyone was a Christian. You know, honestly, we've progressed. We've gotten a little smarter. We, we've grown up a little bit. We understand that, you know, that was nice for them, but not for us. And so uh, even well-meaning, people are trying to pursue faith, pursue Jesus, have bought into the cultural influences of the day and so they, they've walked away from their faith. They, what we call, deconstructed their faith. They took what they've known and, and broke it apart. And the point of that is that they never reconstruct it in a healthy way. In fact, people that I know who have deconstructed, they've walked away from faith, don't even give faith another shot. And so I just wanna encourage you, if you're feeling that way today, if you feel like, man, I've, I'm asking hard questions about what I was raised with or the belief system I had, and you kind of broken it apart. Hey, listen, I get that. Build it, reconstruct it, get in a Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, faith-filled church. Or, or, or you could keep watching Rock Creek. I think the last one is what I call personal trauma. Personal trauma. This is where the suffering is not just in the world, but the suffering is that you're experiencing it. You've gone through a hard thing, You've been through some loss. You've been through some things that, that caused you to ask, God, where are you in this? Where are you in, in my pain? And I think if you live long enough, you realize that this world we live in is broken. This world we live in is fallen. This world that we live in is filled with sin and people. So it's imperfect. It's definitely not heaven. And so there is some pain. And I'm gonna help us walk through some of these um, 
objections to faith today that will hopefully counteract and, and really I'm believing it to fill your soul with, with a strength to not lose your faith in the midst of these hard things like personal trauma. So really here's the hard choice. Here's the hard choice for all of us. If we wanna go hashtag adulting, here's the hard choice. The choice is to live a life marked by biblical faith. That's the hard choice. In a world that's trending away from faith, in a world that is asking hard questions like where is God in the midst of war and pain and tragedy and famine and death and disease and when you're experiencing hypocrisy from a church experience where you were judged or you, you felt like you were put on the out because you weren't actually supposedly on the end. Like all of these, in a world that's, that's heading that way, may there be a, a group of people who are making the hard choice to live a life marked by biblical faith. So, so let me define it for you because I think that'll be helpful. Biblical faith defined, trusting completely in who Jesus is and what he has done for me. Let, let me add a, just a, a little, one more thought. Biblical faith is trusting completely in who Jesus is and what he's done for me so that I can know God forever. Okay, th there's the complete, like full meal deal. Biblical faith. If the hard choice is to live a life marked by biblical faith, then I need to live a life where I trust Jesus completely, not just who he is, not just that he was God, that he's Lord and Savior, but he's my Lord and Savior, so that I can have a relationship with God, I can know God forever, and not just know God forever, but I can know God here and now. Because Jesus says, if you wanna know my Father, you gotta go through me, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to God except through my life. And so as a Christian, if we're gonna be marked by biblical faith, it means this, that everything within me pursues a life of faith, which is simply this, completely trusting in who Jesus is and what he's done for me so that I can know God here and know God forever. And that word know is not just know in your head, but know in your heart. Being a Christian is not behavior modification, it's heart transformation. So at Rock Creek, we don't want you to know God in your head, but we want you to experience a heart transformation. So the question for all of us, will you be hashtag adulting? Will you grow up in the midst of all of those objections, live a life marked by biblical faith? I entitled today's talk, Faith That Fights, or say it this way, Fighting for Faith. Because in a world that's fighting amongst each other, fighting for what we think is valuable, I want to propose that the best thing you can do as a person who's trying to pursue Jesus is fight for your faith. Because faith matters. Faith matters in our relationship. In fact, it is the very thing that, that we build upon. So, so let me say it this way. Faith is the cornerstone for relationship with God. And if you have never heard the word or phrase cornerstone, it's the cornerstone is the the, the the building block, the, the stone that was laid, the Bible calls Jesus the cornerstone, and everything else is built around that and, and off of that. They, they mark the center of the foundation, the, the cornerstone, they mark the foundation with it, and then they built out from there. That is faith. What is biblical faith? Let's define it because it's important for us not to have faith in our faith, but faith in what? Who Jesus is and what he's done for me so that I can know God Again, not just in my head, but in my heart, forever and here and now. Faith is the cornerstone. So everything we build upon in a relationship with God is, is starting with our faith, biblical faith, Jesus, who he is and what he's done for me. Look at Hebrews 11 says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So it's impossible to know God, to please him, to be in relationship with God without faith. What is biblical faith? Believing who Jesus is and what he's done for me. What did Jesus do? Jesus came to earth, blameless, perfect, spotless, innocent, 
was pierced to a cross, bloodied and beaten, buried in a grave, and he rose again, which we will celebrate on Easter. Why? To prove his power over death, hell, and the grave, because there was a chasm between humanity and God. That chasm was caused by sin. When you're born, you're born with a propensity towards sin, but when you're actually in Christ, that propensity towards sin is now a desire towards God. The cross bridged the gap between us and God forever, which is God's original plan, is that we have perfect relationship with him. And so Jesus came, the cornerstone of our faith. But listen, if you want to have a relationship with God, you, you got you to gotta have some faith. You got to build something. I think another important thing of why faith is worth fighting for is that faith is a source of hope in troubled times. Have you ever had some troubled times? Have you ever had some things you're going through that just are overwhelming to your senses and emotions and your, your humanity, and it leads you to a place to go, what am I supposed to do with this? How do I get out of this hole? How do I manage this heartbreak? How do I go through this diagnosis? How do I deal with this financial trouble? Faith in who Jesus is and what he's done for you so that you can know God, not just in your head, but in your heart forever and here and now, is a source of hope in troubled times. It actually says Jesus is the anchor of our hope. He can show up when all hell's breaking loose. Here's a great example of it in Matthew 9. They went right into the house where he was staying, and Jesus asked them, do you believe I can make you see? Yes, Lord, they told him we do. So you have a couple people who literally lost their sight, their physical sight, and, and Jesus shows up to do some ministry, and he goes, hey, hey, you got some trouble. I can see it, and you can see it, but you can't see it. Like literally, he goes, and, and he asked him, do you believe? What is belief? Belief is trust. What is trust? Trust is faith. Do you have biblical faith in the midst of your trouble to believe that I can rescue you, redeem you, transform you, take your addiction and break it off for you, take the chains that hold you down and, and break the chains off your life to help, help propel you into your future? Why? Because there is a future that's joyful and confident when you have faith. And so they, they said to him, yeah, we do believe, we do believe. Because faith is a source of hope in troubled times. I think number three, faith is also a catalyst for what I call spiritual growth. Listen, without faith, and biblical faith we define it, believing in who Jesus is and what he's done for you, so that you can know God forever and here and now, not just in your head, but in your heart. Faith is a catalyst for spiritual growth. So we build on faith, it's a source of hope in troubled times, and it's a catalyst for spiritual growth. James 2, look what it says. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. So think about it. Let me give you a quick theological lesson because I think it's important for you to see how faith and actions work together. Listen, the gospel is a pose to earning your salvation. The good news of Jesus is that you couldn't be good enough, work hard enough to earn grace. It's why Jesus came. So the gospel is opposed to earning salvation. But let me say it very clearly, the gospel is not opposed to work. So we're saved by grace through faith, but then out of that posture of faith comes a great work. The Bible says work out your salvation. Work from salvation. And James nailed it. Faith and actions were working together. Why? So his faith, here it is, could be made complete. It could be a catalyst for spiritual growth. So it's not one or the other, it's, but, but it's understanding that the gospel is opposed to earning, but the gospel is not opposed to working. So when you have faith, it becomes a catalyst for desire, a want to, to grow spiritually. 
So will we make the hard choice today to live a life that's marked by biblical faith? Because here's how faith becomes a catalyst. Here, here, here it is, I'm gonna give you three thoughts around this. Faith is an energizer. Come on, it, it, it gets you excited. It gets you filled up. It, it, if your tank was low, it, it's, it's overflowing. If, I mean, think about what gets you excited. Just, maybe just close your eyes and think about what gets you excited. Like maybe it's a vacation, maybe it's a, a car, may, may, maybe it's a relation. Like it just gets you pumped. Like faith is way, way beyond that. F- faith fills you up with some supernatural energy that, that gets you excited about your day. Faith is a catalyst for spiritual growth. I think uh, faith, another great, great way to say it is that faith is an elevator. That, that if you're down on basement level, going, God, where are you? intellectual objections, some trauma personally, some church hurt, some, some things that you're struggling with, asking God how can pain exist and you exist simultaneously, like, and you're in the basement floor. Faith is an elevator to lift you up out of there and take you to the penthouse where you can see clearly from God's vantage point. That's what faith does. Because faith believes in who Jesus is and what he's done for you, which, which means you can have a relationship with God forever and here and now, but not just in your head, but actually in your heart. Faith is an elevator. It's a catalyst for spiritual growth. I think faith is also an eliminator. Faith goes, here's what's most important. Here's, here's what really matters. Here, here, here's, here's what you're supposed to do with your life. It's the great eliminator. It, it takes out what's not important and, and it focuses you on what is important. Faith and works, working together, and what happens? Your faith becomes complete, mature. Hashtag adulting, full grown. Faith is a catalyst because it eliminates what you don't need to have in your life. I think it's worth fighting for also because faith reveals God to the world we live in. I think faith is our tool for evangelism, that when we're going through hard things, when we have questions that maybe couldn't be answered or T's that haven't been crossed and I's that haven't been dotted. Faith reveals God to a world we live in. Look at Hebrews 11, one says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So the world in which we live is like, you believe in a God you can't see? And you're like, yeah. Really? That you're a smart person and we, we, you know, you're educated. We, we, know, we know you and, and you're gonna believe in a God that you can't see? Yeah. Why? Because I have faith. Faith, yeah, faith in Jesus is who he said he was and he's done for me what I couldn't do for myself and so I have a relationship with God forever and I experience the shame and guilt of brokenness and sin off my life and experience a fresh perspective and, and just seeing God at work and, and faith is the greatest evangelism tool in a world that has doubts, in a world that's, that's moving away or anti-faith. There needs to be a, a, a group of people, the church, It says, no, in the midst of the hard things of life, I have a confidence in what we hope for. I'm assured, which means I'm unshakable, I'm immovable, I'm not going anywhere. Even though I don't see it, I believe it. Even though I don't know all the answers, I trust him anyways. That's what faith is. Faith puts you in, in a position where you say yes even before you know the question to God. Faith is a powerful weapon in the life of a follower of Jesus. Faith is the evangelism tool in which God wants to bring into these last days revival of an awakening of people's spirits and souls. Faith is worth fighting for number five because it produces a proper perspective. I think one of the greatest things any person can challenge or evaluate in their life is their perspective. Because I've heard it said before, it's not what happens to you that matters in this life. It's the story you tell yourself. It's the story that you write about what's happening to you that really matters. What is that? It's perspective. Problems can be problems or they can be an opportunity. Life can be painful or it can, be, it can produce something of value in your life. See, faith produces a proper 
perspective because it reveals what life is really all about. Look what it says in this beautiful scripture. In all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. It goes on to say, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. First Peter finishes by saying, for you are receiving the end result, here it is, of your faith. What is the end result of your faith? Salvation of your souls. At the end of the day, faith is worth fighting for because it gives us perspective that no matter what happens in this life, no matter the doubts that we carry maybe through our entire life, no matter the questions that, that remain unanswered, no matter the painful situations that we go through, faith says, even in all of that, because of Jesus, I could know God forever. Because of Jesus, I can be made new. Because of Jesus, even if I have pain, I still win. I still spend eternity with God forever. I still have the promise of the Father that he'll never leave us nor forsake us here and now. You might be going through a hard time, but God is with you and that's the promise of faith. Perspective in the midst of your pain. Perspective in the midst of the existential questions like, God, where are you in the world? Where are you in this, this brokenness that I'm seeing on the news and in my friends and in my family, and maybe even in your own life? Where are you? Faith says, I'm building on something, the cornerstone, which is Jesus. Faith says, you know what? It's gonna be a catalyst for spiritual growth in my life. It's gonna energize me, it's gonna elevate me, and it's gonna eliminate what's not important. Faith gets me a perspective that I could not have on my own. And so I'm praying today that you'll make the hard choice, the adulting choice that says, you know what? I'm gonna live a life marked by biblical faith. Not faith that's in my own ability or my own uh, uh, effort, but faith that's in the gospel that says you don't have to earn it, it's undeserved privilege. You don't have to work harder for salvation, you work from salvation. And so today the good news for you is that no matter how far you are from God, he's saying come home today. He's saying come on, I want a relationship with you today. So if you need that in your life, I wanna invite you to pray with me in just a moment maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time, that today is your moment you step into faith and build on the cornerstone. Into faith that will be a catalyst for your spiritual awakening and spiritual growth. So if you're ready to make that commitment to follow Jesus for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time, would you just join me in a prayer wherever you're at, no matter whether you're in your car or on YouTube or social media, on our website, just love to just pray over you and you can just receive this. Today, Jesus, I'm making the decision to have faith in you. Today, Jesus, I'm marking my life with biblical faith of who you are, Jesus, and what you've done for me. Today, I'm asking that you would forgive me and wash me of my sins, take my life and transform it. From this day forward, I'm following you and you alone. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer, that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning of your spiritual journey. Today you would, what I call, hit the home run. But, but a home run is nice to hit. I've hit a few in my life. I've even watched a few that are even more fun to watch. But unless they run the bases, the home run doesn't count. And so I wanna encourage you, run the bases today. Look for the link to take your next steps. Join us March 3rd for water baptism. Go public in your faith decision today by being water baptized. Join a group, get some prayer. Uh, join us in person. If you're only watching online, come on, and you live within the region of our facilities, come join us in person and watch what God will do as faith begins to be the mark of your life. 
so proud of you for making decisions to grow in your faith today. As always, Rock Creek Church, you're doing better than you think. God bless.